So my name is Kimberly, and I am a Citizen Empowerment Coordinator with American Promise, along with my colleague, Rosie. Hi. I'm not sure that that, that does much for you. Apparently, our voices are, are so similar, but uh, so you've, you've met two of us now. Um, I promise <laughs> I'm not just uh, pretending to be two people. There we go, some, some dual sounds at the, at the same time. I can't be making that up. Um, all right, we'll look forward to hearing from Rosie later on in the call. Thanks, everyone, for taking time tonight to join us for the June 2019 American Promise Association National Call. This call happens on the second Monday of each month. Um, whether you're here li live or listening to the recording afterwards, you're stepping up to save our democracy, so thank you. And tonight, I have the honor of talking with our guest speaker, Keisha Morris, who is the Census and Mass Incarceration Project Manager at Common Cause. After we hear from Keisha, we'll pass it over to Suzanne Kuntz, member of APA Knoxville, also known as APAC, who will be sharing this month's grassroots victory. And from there, Rosie will discuss this month's action, planning a summer event with a focus on increasing diversity. Um, if we have time after all that, we'll wrap up with the training on how to create a Facebook event. I'd like to start, though, uh, by sharing a story to remind us all why we're here. Last month, I had the chance to travel back to my home state, Minnesota, and launch four APAs in the Twin Cities metro area, uh, an exciting growth spurt made possible by the groundwork Vicki Barnes has been laying there over the past two years. Uh, and while I was there, Vicki told me about the 2018 elections in a county uh, about an hour northwest of the Twin Cities, Wright County, the rural area, to give you a, a sense, the median population of the largest 10 cities in Wright County is 7,000. Um, and in 2018, two of the county commissioners were up for re-election. Uh, both incumbents were running. Um, and you know, perhaps unsurprisingly for a rural area. Um, you know, both of these incumbents spent about $2,000 each on, on their own campaigns. Uh, but Wright County is the site of a landfill owned by Advanced Disposal, a company in Florida. Uh, and with an eye on expanding their landfill, Advanced Disposal ran candidates against those incumbents, and against the $2,000 that each of the incumbents spent, Advanced Disposal poured $45,000 into this rural county election. Uh, and while $45,000 is chump change compared to some of the campaigns we see at the national and even state level, uh, it's the context of the story that makes it one of the most appalling examples to me. A company in Florida running candidates in rural Minnesota and spending over 20 times the usual campaign cost. But the reason why I'm sharing this story, the local incumbents won. Fighting big money is hard because money can buy TV ads and lawn signs and mailers and it can feel like it can buy the vote, but it can't. We still have the vote. We, the people, still have the vote, which means we have just enough democratic power to win back the rest of our democratic rights. We have just enough democratic power to say no to big money. We have just enough democratic power to win this fight. And so, with that, I would like to now introduce our guest speaker, Keisha Morris, Census and Mass Incarceration Project Manager at Common Cause. Keisha leads Common Cause's 2020 Census campaign and the organization's efforts to end mass criminalization. Through Common Cause's core program areas, Keisha guides the Census and Mass Incarceration programs by uplifting issues of money and politics, voting rights, and economic opportunity. Before joining Common Cause in January 2016, Keisha worked with disabled adults as a success coach. Keisha has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Florida Gulf Coast University and a master's degree in political science from American University. And Keisha, I think you'll find the people we've got on the call are kindred spirits. They're American patriots fighting to uphold our great experiment in self-government, people who care about other people, and most importantly, the kind of citizens who take responsibility who take action, who say, if not me, then who? And I hope everyone's brought that spirit to tonight's call. 
I'll be asking Keisha a few questions myself, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A from you guys. So please be thinking of questions uh, and how you'll apply what we discussed to this month's action and anything else that your APA is working on. Um, and when you do think of a question, know that others will probably have the same question now or after the call. This is people listening to the recording. So please ask it for everyone's benefit. Um, and the way to do that will be to press 1 on your keypad to raise your hand. Um, and with that, Keisha, you are off mute. Um, could you kick it off and introduce everyone to your work and talk about what it is that you do? For sure. Uh, so can folks hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming through beautifully. Okay, awesome, wonderful. So, uh, yeah, I just want to start off by saying thank you, uh, Kimberly, and thank you, Rosie, and uh, for inviting me to this call. Um, the work that you all do is so critically important to advancing money and politics reforms. So uh, thank you and thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, I just want to start this conversation off by saying that uh, the underlying issues plaguing our democracy and many of the issues that we care about uh, already, such as you know, climate change, access to education, healthcare, uh, as you know, are influenced by money and politics. And the issue of mass, mass incarceration is definitely uh, no different. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the term mass incarceration, uh, so let me just first explain it. Um, so uh, it is the increase in jail and prison population from uh, less than 200,000 uh, folks incarcerated in 1972 to where it stands today at over 2.2 million uh, people incarcerated. And that is an increase of more than 700%, even though our uh, population, our American population growth has only been uh, about 50% during that time. So uh, also not only including those that are currently incarcerated, uh, in prison, on probation, and on parole, we have over 6.7 million people living under court-ordered supervision. Uh, and many, and millions more that are convicted uh, of felonies experience uh, long-term permanent effects such as uh, felony disenfranchisement uh, and housing and employment discrimination. Uh, the issue of uh, mass incarceration uh, often targets African American and Latino communities uh, and disenfranchises and disempowers millions of Americans uh, and undermines the legitimacy of our democracy. Uh, meanwhile, um, the increase, increasingly profitable industries uh, that service many American prisons use their wealth and influence to obtain lucrative contracts and lobby for industry friendly uh, legislation. Uh, that help uh, elect candidates supportive uh, to their cause, which is to fill more prisons uh, with prisoners. Uh, today, uh, despite uh, little conclusive evidence uh, that prisons stimulate local uh, economic growth, uh, prison facilities support uh, over 5.2 million jobs nationwide, uh, and lawmakers still face uh, political pressure uh, for, for new prison contracts. 65% uh, uh, of private prison contracts also have an occupancy guarantee clause uh, that promises uh, that, um, that their uh, prison locations would be uh, 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 occupied uh, usually up to 90%. Uh, uh, the last thing I'll add uh, before uh, we move to the question and answer uh, portion uh, of the call is that you know overall uh, Amer uh, the American system of mass incarceration from uh, policing, uh, prosecution, uh, running prison, uh, even uh, fees to families costs uh, American taxpayers uh, over $182 billion a year. And the recipients of those dollars have a vested interest in preserving uh, the status quo uh, and maintaining a steady flow of people into the correctional um, system. 
So uh, I'm happy to uh, take some some additional questions. Wow. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I'll uh, kick it off with uh, a few that we want to make sure um, you know we think everyone would be interested in hearing. But I mean, wow, that's like the uh, you know, what you're saying about you know those clauses guaranteeing um, you know 90 percent. Mm -hmm. yeah, being at 90% capacity, that's really something. Um, so thank you for, you know, starting us up on that overview. Um, a big part of the work that our volunteers are doing is uh, meeting with elected officials and, you know, also doing outreach. So they're having a lot of conversations and I'm kind of trying to uh, predict some of the, you know, pushback they might get in, mm -hmm. in bringing this topic up. So. Uh, you know, one thought, you know, is I've, I've heard people say, well, only 7% of state prisons, uh, prisoners and 18% of federal prisoners are held in private prisoners, prisons, excuse me. Um, and so they, you know, you can make the argument that problems of mass incarceration are only minimally owing to corporations. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what your response is to that and, and if there are other common arguments that you hear, what are those uh, and, and how do you, um, you know, continue to argue that uh, pay to play politics and big money is, a, is also a big problem in connection with mass incarceration? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, that is absolutely true, um, you, you know. It is only a small percent of uh, of people that are currently incarcerated or held in private prisons. But uh, where the, the the money really comes from, uh, uh, in addition to private prisons, are uh, additional uh, private contracts. And as I said, that is um, everything uh, from. Um, uh, the public uh, or the commissary industry that's, you know, the health services that they receive, uh, food suppliers, um, uh, and also the, uh, the prison telephone industry. Uh, all of those corporations have gone out of their way to strategize uh, ways to make millions off of the criminal justice system. Uh, so corporations are definitely highly responsible for mass incarceration, uh, but obviously there is not the you know the only driver uh, to to mass incarceration. Um, when you know um, people that are uh, incarcerated uh, don't have access uh, to the vote uh, to change the way that they um, uh, you know. Uh, to be able to influence uh, elections and choose uh, their politicians uh, even after incarceration, you know, that also uh, is, is, is an issue. All right, thanks. Um, and uh, maybe more generally, do you have um, suggestions for uh, talking with elected officials about this subject, uh, you know, do, do you have experience with this? Do you, have you, from that experience, do you have the sense that um, elected officials are aware of how money in politics affects our criminal justice system? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I would definitely say that they are aware. Um, a, a lot of money are, is being spent by these corporations to uh, lobby for favorable policies, uh, for sure. Um, I would just say that it is a part of, you know, their responsibility. Although uh, people that are currently incarcerated um, do not have uh, a, a political voice, as I said, because they cannot uh, vote oftentimes, um, you know, it is up to folks like us to be able to speak out on, on their behalf, for sure. Um, uh, I would also definitely say uh, that, you know, you can pull up, you know, where the legislature uh, through open, uh, the legislator through open secrets has, um, uh, if they have received uh, money from uh, some of these uh, corporations like the, the GEO Group or uh, Corrections Corporation of America um, and use some of those uh, figures to, you know, um, 
um, influencer, you know, say, hey, you know, you're getting money from uh, XYZ uh, Corporation, uh, what are you doing to ensure that our communities are safe? Uh, because mass incarceration um, almost does not uh, keep our communities safe, for sure. Um, it is um, it is actually a, a driver of um, of uh, criminal activity. So uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, rehabilitating our communities uh, instead of uh, driving um, violence and, and recidivism. Wow, thank you. Yes, I think, you know, between in the, the intro, what you were talking about, you know, the cost to taxpayers and um, the fact that it's, uh, you know, increasing increasing crime in our in our communities and definitely not decreasing it. Um, I think those are things that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, hopefully all Americans uh, can get behind. Those are those are not good things. Um, we have uh, some hands up already. So um, if you have a question, please press one. Uh, we're going to get going with Ted. Uh, Ted, you are off mute. If you could tell everyone where you're calling in from and what your question is. Uh, thank you. I'm calling from Columbus, Ohio, Columbus uh, Central Ohio AP. Uh, I think regarding the question that's just being discussed, uh, if someone's making a point or having a conversation with a congressman's office, uh, the relevant question to me is that there's going to be cost regardless whether uh, private prison or the traditional one. Uh, aside from the fact that we're incarcerating way too many people for invalid reasons, uh, the, to me the relevant question would be what's the cost differential of the two, and then maybe more importantly, what percentage of that money goes toward uh, prisoners and all the things that are involved there, including the rehabilitation that was just mentioned, and what percentage goes to uh, the companies they are lobbying for this. It's probably going to be difficult to get that. Uh, they're not going to want to show that, but uh, mm -hmm. I have a strong feeling that a, a disproportionate amount of money in the private sector is going to uh, the people who are behind all of this and the money going toward the, toward the uh, maybe care is not the right word, but uh, uh, housing the prisoners and giving them a reasonable um, healthy standard of living uh, is probably much lower there than it is in the traditional one. I don't know that, but uh, to me, those are the relevant issues if we're going to try to get a congressman to compare or to give a rationale, why are we going this private route? Uh, that seems to be the trend, and that's what the lobbyists and the big money companies are after. What's the benefit of that to taxpayers? What's the benefit to prisoners? I suspect it's probably neither. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Ted, uh, for that point. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, the uh, 800, uh, sorry, the 182 uh, billion dollar number that I mentioned um, that uh, taxpayers pay uh, into uh, the prison uh, uh, industrial complex, um, as you you. Uh, correctly stated, you know, goes into the pockets of, um, of corporations uh, for their profit. Uh, a lot of times uh, we see that private prisons um, have a much lower uh, standard uh, of health than, um, than public prisons do uh, before uh, the Trump administration um, at the end of the Obama era. Uh, we saw that uh, there was a move to close private prison contracts, and that is one of the reasons uh, why. Um, but yeah, for more data, there are there's a bunch of data um, on you know uh, where where money in the in the criminal justice system goes um, at the, the Prison Policy Initiative website, so PrisonPolicyInitiative.org. Uh, and there you'll find uh, a host of reports and, and facts and figures uh, about, you know, how um, taxpayer dollars are being spent um, uh, towards 
uh, the prison industrial complex. Neat. Prisonpolicyinitiative.org. Sounds mm-hmm. like a good resource. All right. Um, next hand, Nancy, you are off mute. If you want to tell everyone where you're calling in from and what your question is. Hi, everybody. This is Nancy. I'm from Northern Virginia. Keisha, this is really interesting. In Virginia, in terms of money and politics, we're looking at basically fossil fuels, dominion, energy, payday lenders, some tobacco companies, uh, companies but I never really thought about about prisons, although in a couple cases I've heard people talk about them. Do you have any state-specific case studies on the prevalence of, of, of prisons? If we wanted to do a short case study to distribute or to use in a letter of, uh, to the editor, where can we find this data? And even like to know what are the, na- we have pretty uh, uh, Virginia public access um, pr- project which has actually a lot of information about money going to, to elected officials, but I wouldn't even know the names of the corporations. What, should, I, should I be going to this prisonpolicy.org or what are the best sources of information? Yeah, so prison policy. Okay, I was making sure I wasn't on mute. Sorry. Uh, Prisonpolicy.org uh, is a great resource. They um, have profiles on uh, every single state. Uh, just for a quick uh, search on their website, um, it says that you know 69,000 folks uh, in Virginia are behind bars today, uh, and that. Makeup is uh, 38,000 uh, people in state prison uh, and federal prison. He has six, uh, over 6,000, and then in local jail, it's pretty high, is uh, 23,000. 23, um, but yeah, you can find all that information on prisonpolicy.org. Uh, Common Cause also has a report that really lays out uh, the democracy impacts of, of mass incarceration um, that we did uh, released uh, last year. Um, so, and that is uh, democracybehindbars.org. And that, folks, um, was part of the, uh, the emails that were sent out, and we'll also send that in a follow-up. So um, if that's something that piqued your interest, um, know that you might have that sitting in your inbox. All right, next up, Monica, you are off mute. If you want to let everyone know where you're calling in from and what your question is. Hi, it's Monica. I'm calling from Montclair, New Jersey. And um, Ted essentially asked my question, which was the cost differential between the, the public and private, which I unfortunately knocked myself off the call before I heard the answer, but that's okay. I don't want to go in the weeds. But just to point out, it's not impossible to find out how much is going into the pockets of the, um, the owners and the shareholders of those companies because you can, most, many of them are public, and you can simply look it up and see what their profit was and the bottom line and what their dividends were. And that's the taxpayer money that's going through this and going into the pockets of, of shareholders, which I think one thing is, you know, I don't want to advocate for a prison economy, but to the extent we do have prisons, we should be keeping that money in a closed circle, not having a leakage out to dividends and to stock buybacks, um, aside from all the other reasons why it's a horrendous industry. Um, and so I, I, so I couldn't miss that. I didn't know if you gave the, the differential, if you want to give it quickly, or, or I could, um, you know, get somebody, get back to somebody offline and see what that number was. Yeah, I also think that the call um, is recorded. Is that right? Um, yes. Okay. But yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I didn't say the the exact uh, numbers, but I did say that the prison policy initiative. Uh, has um, that uh, breakdown in you know how um, money is flowing through the prison industrial complex. Thanks for repeating that. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, next up, Kathy, you are off mute. If you want to let everyone know where you're calling in from and what your question is. Hi, my name is um, Kathy. I'm calling in from St. Paul, Minnesota. And I actually um, took some time to to briefly read through the um, Democracy Behind Bars. 
And in listening to this conversation, um, and specifically um, on the effects of uh, prosecution and prosecutor elections, it talks about the extent of the power that local prosecutors have, which is really pretty remarkable. Um, mm -hmm. It basically, prosecutors, they're, they drive to um, to get a, a guilty. I mean, they don't want to go to trial. They just want somebody to plead guilty. There's a lot of pressure on these people to plead guilty. And one of the questions I have is, is there a connection between these for-profit prisons um, in their area and or other money sources given to the prosecutors? Because their drive is not about justice, about right and wrong. It's more about getting a, a specific amount of, you know, what they would call positive incarceration or, you know, getting people in prison. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's a connection between the money that is kind of driving this and the, and putting these prosecutors um, in their seats. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really uh, interesting question. Um, and if I think I am getting it right, you're asking if there is a relationship between uh, where um, uh, uh, prisoners uh, or you know prisoners go and um, uh, and uh, uh, you know if it's related to um, where uh, where donations come from um, in uh, their prosecutor election. Yeah, Jesse, yeah, so you're asking me if you okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really interesting um, theory that I do not I have not, I have not seen uh, done, but um, one thing that uh, that. I am thinking about is that you know judges are uh, determine uh, where uh, where folks go, um, not so much uh, the prosecutors, but I mean judges is another area, especially um, you know most places elect uh, their judges. And um, there was also a story uh, not uh, too long ago that. Um, um, uh, that a, a judge um, was responsible for uh, sending uh, children, really, uh, to to uh, to juvie or even in some cases adult prison um, at the uh, uh, bequest, really, of. Uh, his major donors. So um, that is something that we do know uh, happens. I have not seen uh, a study uh, that relates to, you know, uh, where uh, judges or prosecutors are getting their money from, and if it relates to, um, you know, um, the, their uh, prosecution rates uh, and where uh, where folks are sent. Wow. Again, just uh, really more really shocking, um, yeah, shocking stories uh, for, you know, a system that that is so valuable and meant to be delivering good. Um, you know, just want to round out our time with you, Keisha, by um, asking you uh, a little bit of a, a broader question here. Um, so our you know, each each month on these calls, we introduce an action of the month uh, to our APA members. Um, and this month, the action is to uh, plan an event uh, with the the goal of increasing diversity in mind. Um, and a lot of the information that we've provided is about um, reaching out to communities of color. Uh, and you know, this issue of mass incarceration, like you said, uh, disproportionately impacts communities of color. And so, um, you know, whether it's perhaps, you know, specifically in connection to, um, you know, somehow ties in with the issue of mass incarceration or, um, 
broader, if you have any tips for our EPA members that are on the call uh, in, uh, you know, as they pursue this, this action of the month of trying to plan an event where uh, they bring in more diversity. Yeah, I think that is uh, amazing. Um, there are not uh, very many uh, democracy organizations that are uh, focused on um, uh, the issues of mass incarceration. Um, so it's awesome that you are uh, bringing those issues to communities of color. Um, one, uh, I guess, advice that I would give um, is one to be patient, I guess, with um, uh, organizations of color. Um, I feel like a lot of the times they are often, you know, grossly underfunded and they are, you know, uh, attacking the issues uh, that they can um, that are immediately facing um, their community. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the issue of money and politics and how it connects to mass incarceration might not be um, their uh, top priority. Um, but uh, I would definitely think that it is worth, you know, engaging and educating uh, groups, uh, local groups, uh, about the issue. Um, and, you know, just engage them in really authentic ways um, would, be my, would be my suggestion. Um, uh, I would say um, that, uh, you know, maybe some groups that you can start with. Um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, national groups that have the capacity to, that operate also on the local level. But we have the capacity to, you know, reach out. And a lot of the times, you know, it's the trusted organizations um, that uh, are able to reach the community. And, um, you know, uh, groups like uh, the NAACP or the Urban League or the Rainbow Push Coalition uh, have access to, you know, local groups um, that may be able to also be that that trusted voice uh, to then, uh, you know, uh, engage with, with uh, other local groups as well. So, um, yeah, that would just be my one, uh, my one um, advice. <laughs> I love these advice, but um, I, I think it's awesome um, that um, American Promise is uh, hoping to uh, engage uh, people of color in, in the work that well, thank you for that. Um, and thanks everyone for all the questions you asked. Um, and Keisha, just you know, for for joining us tonight and uh, informing us uh, all more about this, uh, you know, very interestingly and you know perhaps un unfortunately interesting uh, topic. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all again for inviting me. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, that was absolutely an, an honor. Uh, one of the many reasons I'm excited to have joined American Promise, being able to talk with people like Keisha. Um, and moving along, as we mentioned uh, each month, uh, we talk about uh, how we're tracking on um, some of the progress that uh, we look to make, build on, on year over year. Um, and one of the ways that we track the growth of our movement uh, is striving to increase uh, the number of meetings with elected officials we have, uh, the number of public events we hold, and the number of media pieces written. Um, and tonight I'm going to go a little bit more um, and give a little bit more of an in-depth update on, on each of those for you guys. Um, so for meetings with elected officials, I want to let you guys know that we are looking good. In 2017, APA has held 17 meetings with elected officials and their staff. Uh, in 2018, that number was 137. Our goal for this year is 200, um, and we expect close to 100 to come from uh, a single day, lobby day, which will be in October. 
October 21st in DC. Um, and so again, you know, with the, the goal for the year being 200, we expect 100 to come from Lobby Day. And so far in the first six months of non-Lobby Days, so to speak, we have completed 40 meetings with elected officials or their staffers. Um, so if we can get another 40 in the next six months of, of mostly non-Lobby Days, we'll reach our goal. So good work. Keep that up. Um, and uh, because you guys are crushing it in this department, I want to point out that one of the ways that you can prepare for your meetings is by writing letters to the editor and op-eds that you can bring into these meetings or publicly and directly share with your elected officials on social media. Um, and I make this point because we could use some work in the media pieces department. In 2017, APAs had 26 pieces published. In 2018, 93 pieces. And our goal for 2019 is 212 media pieces published. Right now, we are only at 42. So we encourage you to be working with one another. Maybe take some time in every APA meeting to write letters to the editor. Uh, and let me or Rosie know if you have any questions or if there's anything we can do um, to help you become letter machines. And, and hopefully those, again, will help you in those meetings that you guys are absolutely crushing at getting. Um, and last but not least, for public events, uh, we are almost on track. APA has held 72 events in 2018, and our goal for 2019 is 80 public events. Uh, so far this year, we've held 32. Um, so we're a little behind the halfway mark toward our goal. And we're hoping that you guys will use these next summer months to hold some more events than usual, get us back on track or even ahead of schedule come autumn. Um, and our action of the month and the resource we've developed around it should help with that. But again, please reach out to myself or Rosie if you want further help. Um, and the critical step in tracking all of this gro growth, please remember to tell us about the successes that you have in these areas, meetings, media pieces published, public events, by submitting reporting forms. Um, and you can do that by going to the Resources tab of the website, AmericanPromise.net. You'll see our resource library where you can find resources to help uh, in taking these actions. And then if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see the reporting forms for letting us know about successful actions. All right, enough of me. I now get to turn it over to Suzanne Coates from Knoxville for our grassroots victory. Um, she'll be talking about a victory where she um, and her fellow APA members have been absolutely um, crushing it in many ways lately. Suzanne is organizing a social event to recruit new members, which is building off their recent momentum, uh, having made a TV appearance, having met with a state representative, and as we're going to hear about, meeting with their Republican U.S. representative, Tim Burchett. Um, so let me take you off mute, Suzanne, one moment. All right. Great. Suzanne, you um, are off mute. Thanks for being here to share. Uh, take it away. Great. Thanks. Um, I'm not a political person at all. I often say I do the heart part while my co-leader, Chet, does the hard part. I speak from the perspective of someone that has never been interested or involved in politics but woke up in 2016 to realize I no longer have a voice. And Chet, along with other members of my group, can talk about the specifics of how we got to this place and what needs to be done to fix it legislatively. All I know is we have to do something, and that's why I'm involved. I think that getting big money influence out of our elections is the ground zero for nearly everything else our country needs right now to get back on track and begin moving forward again. For this reason, I chose to reach out to our newly elected Republican Congressman, Tim Burchett. I graduated high school with him and know him personally, which for some people may seem easier, but for me was even more stressful. Meeting with a stranger seems less personal as any mistakes won't be remembered much past leaving their office. I built a team. I took three members from our group, another classmate, a more politically minded member, and a more politically knowledgeable member, which I felt made a well-rounded team. I called to set the appointment and was told by his scheduler that he had been hit hard 
in Washington by American Promise members, <laughs> a proud moment, but hadn't heard from any constituents yet, so we could meet with them for 15, 20 minutes. After the pleasantries were over, Tim listened to what each of us had to say. He agreed wholeheartedly that big money in politics is killing the federal government. As a newly elected member, he spoke of the expectations he faced to fundraise most of the time and how his choosing not to do so impacted his ability to participate fully and get anything done. He's really discouraged by it. Tim was very interested in learning more about American Promise and the 28th Amendment and said he'd reach out to Congressman Katko, whom he considers a friend, to find out more. At 25 minutes into our meeting, Tim kicked the two members of our team he didn't know out of his office to speak to his classmates alone for another 20 minutes. During this more personal meeting, Tim spoke candidly about what it's like in Congress and how disappointed he is with what he's seen. He's angry that big money influence is all that matters to his fellow legislators. He spoke, for example, of voting against hurricane aid, which he wanted to give, but caused the bill had too much unnecessary pork in it. So what is our success? Tim agreed to work on it for us. While he didn't agree to definitely support HJR2 or HJR48, he did promise he would look into it further. We do understand this is just a small first step. We will have to visit with him again to continue the discussion and to push for him to do as he said he would. But we all left there feeling positive that we had made an important step in recruiting another member to our cause. This cause is about taking small steps to create a huge momentum. Absolutely, Suzanne, thank you for sharing. Um, and, and definitely, I'm glad that you, you just see it as, um, as the first step in, in building your relationship with Representative Burchett. But um, I would say that was certainly a big, small step. So nice job. And um, yeah, yeah, I think you know, a, a great story to be, be sharing with our network. I, you know, given the cross-partisan support for the 28th Amendment among voters, um, I think it's a, a common frustration among those of us that are working on this issue to see the mostly partisan support um, at the congressional level, you know, in the support that bills like HJR2 and HJR48 have. Um, so it's great to hear more about how the tide is beginning to shift. Uh, HJR2, we know, was introduced with cross-partisan support, uh, with Republican John Katko joining Democrat Ted Deutsch to lead this important bill. So it's great to hear about this story and be reminded uh, that the way we're going to amass the cross-partisan political power we need is through meetings like this one um, that you guys just had. Um, persistence is, is the word here and the payoff. A constitutional amendment will be historic. Um, so thanks, Suzanne, for, for your work, for taking that, uh, that big, small step and for sharing your story. Um, and now I get to turn it over to Rosie, who is going to introduce this month's action. Rosie, take it away. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. Um, that was really an amazing story, Suzanne. Thank you for sharing. And also, it was such an honor to hear from Keisha as well. Uh, my favorite part of American Promise is just hearing everyone's stories and how, no matter what background we come from, we all have something to bring to this conversation, which is kind of what we're trying to do with this month's action. Uh, so this month's action is planning a summer event focused on partnering with organizations serving diverse groups, particularly including people of color and young people. To start off, I'm just kind of curious to ask everyone here, have any of you ever had any conversations maybe while tabling at events or at an APA meeting that discussed the 28th Amendment in the context of issues that largely affect people of color and communities of that background? If you've had a similar experience or maybe you have a thought regarding this issue, go ahead and press 1 on your keypad just because I'd love to hear from the group on where we're starting from. And it's okay if your one keypad is broken. You can press any number and we'll call on you. Uh, oh, great. Monica has her hand up. So go ahead, Monica. Your hand's up. Or rather, you're off mute. And go ahead. Say where you're calling from and what's up. Hi again, it's Monica. I'm calling from New Jersey. What's there? Um, so, as you might be aware, we have um, a very big 
uh, immigration housing problem in New Jersey going on where we've taken these contracts to um, incarcerate immigrants, but it also has brought to light the condition in some of the prisons. Um, so, I mean, if we're involved in trying to get rid of these um, these contracts. We actually have a freeholders meeting Wednesday that we'll be going to, and through that, I mean, you can't, you just can't separate the discussions between the money and the contracts and how people are being treated, and so that's where I have conversations on it. Yeah, totally. Thank you so, so much for sharing. Housing is a huge problem in this country, especially in New Jersey um, and also down south. So, yeah, the, we, the way we can tie in that conversation to money and politics, I think, is a great idea. Um, I see Shoshana has her hand up, so I'll call on Shoshana, and then we'll go into to talking about the action more. Go ahead, Shoshana. You're, uh, you're off mute. So I was really glad that Keisha um, said be patient. Um, I've been going to um, NAACP meetings locally for about six months, and okay. yeah, um, but I really haven't brought up my issue because, um, well, to be honest, it would feel it doesn't feel respectful, and and navigating, you know, as a as a white person navigating what. Um, um, what's appropriate and not putting my agenda on other people. Um, I'm, I feel very sensitive to that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to cultivate a relationship and, and, and see where it evolves. Um, so I guess I feel... Um, I don't know if there's a fast way of doing that. So that's all I have. That's that's my question and comment. Yeah, of how do you <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That's amazing to be going to those meetings and I, I really, really appreciate uh what you said. It's definitely important to create a space or rather foster a space where you, people uh that you're meeting with feel heard and that they feel seen and appreciated. So what you're doing is perfect, just like fostering those relationships and building relationships it's what Kimberly and I do for most of our like our job, and it takes time to like make people feel trusted and make people feel that you hear them. So I would just continue what you're doing with going to the meetings, offer your help and support, and then the, I'm sure that they want to hear from you too. Like uh, an issue that you're experiencing, they might be experiencing as well. So I would just keep doing what you're doing. I think that's really perfect. Um, I'm gonna call on Nancy, and then we'll go into uh, our action. So go ahead, Nancy. Hi, this is this is Nancy again from Northern Virginia. I appreciated that comment about the NWACP because I had the similar when I asked them if they wanted to co-sponsor an event. They said it's really not their issue. But apart from the prison issue, which I think is interesting, I, I got in touch with a Virginia organizing group which for 30 years works on community empowerment in like 15 different areas of Virginia. And the reason I sort of saw them was through a payday lending article because payday lending is a big issue in terms of money going in and influencing legislation on interest rates. So I think it's interesting that now, now I've learned not to talk, you know, on the money and politics, but to find these specific issues like payday lending is very much a concern of lower income uh, and a lot of times in very different yeah. communities. So that's also it's an interesting entry point too. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for sharing. There's so many issues that affect predominantly people of color that we that are related to our issue of money and politics. So I, I appreciate you reaching out to them. I'm sorry that they maybe turn you down, maybe doing another outreach uh, at one point I would encourage. Um, but uh, moving on. Um, so those are some really great examples. And we've seen some really great examples in action recently uh, with regards to helping with your events become more accessible, like maybe booking a venue that was quieter for people with hearing impairments or along a bus route if people don't have a car. Decisions like this can make all the difference in making your APA as accessible as possible to people with a variety of experiences and perspectives. And to make your events and your group rather most accessible to diverse groups, the first step is to consciously have that goal 
And the second step is to actively build that into your planning and your decision making. We time and time again, example after example shows that if organizations aren't building the goal of diversity into their recruitment system, it just doesn't happen. There's this great example uh, from Stephen Colbert's effort to hire more female writers. Talking about it, he said, uh, quote, we would tell the agents and recruiters, you know, it's important. We want writers of color. We want women. And you would get 150 packets, and there would be like eight women. And we'd say, that's very frustrating, until Stephen said, no, only women. And then they got 87 women hired. And so he thought, where were these people before? And it's the sort of realization of his naivete and that it's not enough to say you want it. You have to go to the not ordinary step. So as I repeat, you have to go to the not ordinary step. Be creative about it. And what we recommend as your first not ordinary step is to partner as early as possible with groups in the communities that you want to see in your APA. So if you haven't started planning the event for this summer, that's fine. We're still in late spring. Uh, so you can approach these groups with some general ideas about the type and timing of your event. But by having these communities represented, when you decide on a date and venue and everything else, it will make it so much easier to take all these other not so ordinary steps. To think about the people, or rather how easily people can hear, and whether the location is on a bus route, and all the details we aren't considering yet. If you've already started planning an event, that's totally okay. You did a great job working on public outreach. You can still reach out to these groups to express your interest in having attendees and members from their communities. And ask yourself, what can we do to make our event more accessible? Could we advertise the event in the community or to ask the group you're reaching out to, do they have tips on doing so? You can make them a co-host for your Facebook event. And maybe you can carve time out for someone from that group to speak at the event. Because they're trying to build their membership base as well, and they're trying to get their cause say out there. So if you can work together to both further your causes, that's a win-win on all sides. So this month's action sheet has some examples of the organizations that you can reach out to that serve people of color, but don't let that limit you as you think about who to partner with. If you can think outside of the box and getting partners to the event planning table, it will make it so much easier to think about outside the box and planning the event because it won't be outside the box to them. So this action sheet also has a step-by-step -step guidance for creating a Facebook event, as well as some just general tips for event planning and how to have a successful event. But I want to check in with everyone about this first step of partnering with diverse groups. Does anyone have any questions, or do you have an experience or maybe a suggestion that you want to share with the group before we wrap up that might help anyone in their action? So if you do, go ahead and press 1 on your keypad. We'd really love to hear from you. I see uh, Barbara and Steve Miller have their hand up, so go ahead, uh, Barbara and or Steve. You're, you're off mute. I just have a quick question, and it may be slightly off topic, but I note this year that Netroots Nation is in Philadelphia. Is American Promise involved with that at all? What, what was the organization? Netroots Nation. Uh, not to my knowledge. I'll write it down. Um, but it's in Philadelphia, you say? Yes, yes. It's a three-day uh, convention in Philadelphia in uh, late ju uh, July. Got it. Uh, to my knowledge, no, but I'll bring it up at work tomorrow. Thank you for that, tip. Okay, great. Does anyone else have any questions, comments regarding how do you reach out to uh, diverse groups of color? If not, that's okay. We can talk uh, about... Um, how to create a Facebook event, which I can turn over to Kimberly. Yep, absolutely. Um, and if you guys do think of uh, questions later, please, uh, you know, as as always, uh, contact myself or Rosie with those. Um, with these final few minutes. Um, we're I'm just going to talk through in case that helps. Um, the, the steps on the action sheet about creating a Facebook event. So um, if you are at a computer, now would be the time to pull up facebook.com uh, and log in. Um, and so fortunately, 
um, you know, if you're if you're not at a computer, um, the steps that are are in the action sheet are very clear, and it's all laid out step by step. And so you you know will be able to refer back to those. And again, as always, Rosie and I are um, always available. And um, you know, if you if you call us looking for for help, we'll appreciate it because we'll know it means that. Uh, they listened to this recording or looked at the action sheet, and so um, we'll be happy to to take that call and offer you some more one-on-one um, -on -one help uh, for creating a Facebook event. Um, so one thing I'll say uh, as I wait for my own Facebook to log in um, is that to create an event where your APA is a host, the person who should log in and be taking the steps should be someone who is an admin. Uh, for your APA Facebook group, um, so if you if you are someone who's interested in, in you know helping to make these Facebook events or just generally help with your group's social media presence, um, and you're not already an admin, um, then you should talk with the the leader of your group um, and leaders. If uh, if you have someone in your group who uh, wants to be taking steps for if they need to be an admin um, and you don't know how to add them as an admin, that is also something that you can reach out to Rosie and myself about. All right, so my Facebook is logged in. Hopefully you guys are too um, if you're following along. Um, and I'm just going to refer back to the steps just so you can see how, how I'm reading them in, in case that helps. So um, we've logged in from your Facebook news feed, which is what pops up automatically when you log in. Click events in the left menu. Okay, so I'm on my page. I see the news feed down the middle. Um, and then over to the left, uh, there's a icon that's red and white and it says events. I click on that. And then there's there's a little step in between each of these steps. Have patience with your internet. Uh, well, all right, guys, I, I, I might, not have enough patience, and we may not have enough time left in this conference call for to wait for my internet browser, unfortunately. So um, I'll go on to the the next step and try to read these out blind, and hopefully your browser speeds are better than mine. So on the left, you should see, I believe it'll be a blue button. It says plus create event, and the plus is the plus symbol. Um, so create event, and then when you click on that, there should be it'll kind of be like a drop-down menu appears. It will give you the option to create a private event or create a public event and select create public event. Um, and this way, anyone will be able to see your event and share it with their network as well. And so once you've clicked create public event, um, a window should pop up in the middle of the screen that has um, you can insert all the, the details for the event. Um, and at the top, it will give you some options for who is the event host. So are you the individual? Um, you know, so it, you know, is Kimberly Clinch the host for this event? Uh, or is it the group that you're in, uh, American Promise? Um, and so this is where you need to be an admin for your APA group. You'll see the option for your APA group to be the host. So select your APA group. Um, and then just work your way down through the rest of the, the form in that pop-up window. Um, fill in the event name, location, date, time, um, a description. You'll have the chance to, to edit these, uh, you know, going forward. So, um, you know, don't, don't worry too much. Um, and then uh, type and select keywords about your public event so it can be better recommended to people who are interested in that topic. Um, so, you know, some, some examples um, would be social justice, uh, documentary, you know, depending on the kind of event you're doing, if you're doing a dark, dark money screening. Um, so this can be a good way to get it on the radar of uh, people that um, are, are new and, and would just be interested in attending this event. And then lastly, step seven, uh, choose who can edit and post in your event and then click create. Um, and from there, you can invite guests, upload photos, add a cover photo, share posts, and critically, edit the event details. So um, again, it's not, it is, these, these details will not be set in stone. Don't, don't worry too much. Uh, you know, do, of course, you know, try to be careful. Better to do it right the first time, but um, don't stress too much. And, 
if you're having any trouble, as always, give give Rosie or I a ring. All right, guys. Well, so it is 9 p.m. here on the East Coast, um, so it's time to say goodbye. But if you have any questions about what we were just discussing, Facebook, or more generally, diversity outreach, or anything else now, or as you get into planning your events, um, please don't hesitate to reach out.